The final myth is that trads are dividing the church by celebrating a different liturgy. Um, there's been a constant, the, the buzzword is unity, <laughs> unity, unity. Um, and I think this requires a little bit of explanation historically, because before Trent, there was a lot of, a lot more diversity in the Western liturgies. First of all, you had these traditional liturgies. You may have heard of the Ambrosian Rite, the Mozarabic Rite, the Saramus. Uh, but there are also local variations in various areas of dioceses and orders all over the West. Um, and then it was, and besides that, there were all these traditional Eastern liturgies as well in various other sacred languages. And so at the time of Trent, there was the issuance of Quo Primum, which su suppressed all the liturgies that were 200 years or less to combat the Protestant iconoclasm, which ended up de facto imposing a uh, uniformity, a greater uniformity at least, on the West under the Roman Rite. Now, as you pointed out, Gregory, to me, there was a, a veto power given to each bishop with pro primo. They could basically- Not, not, not just each bishop, to, uh, every member of every chapter. Ah, okay. So, so there's the staff of the cathedral, because in, in you know in a medieval diocese, the cathedral is the reference point for how we do the liturgy in this diocese. It says with the unanimous consent of the chapter, which means that every single member of the cathedral chapter can veto this by saying, no, I refuse to approve the transition to the, the Roman books. So this is... Um... So the local authorities, like local ecclesiastical authorities, could veto this. But what ended up happening was, to a very large degree, the Roman Rite was adopted yes. very much de facto across the board in the Latin Rite. And so this is a situation that arose after Trent. Right. Um, we're not going to debate about whether or not that was the best approach. But the point is, that was a uniformity that was came up about as a result. Um, which was a loss of this diversity. Yes. And so the other factor, as I said, is the, the Eastern churches. So let me bring up this quote here from another Vatican II document, which is um, the document on the Eastern churches. Now, the interesting thing about this is that during this post-Tridentine period, there was an effort known as Latinizations in the mm -hmm. East, which was... Uh, on the one hand, we can say there's always been some liturgical sharing east and west, yes. a certain amount of sharing here and there, like the Feast of the Holy Cross in the West is an e Eastern feast that was sort of imported into the West. Um, but there was a Latinization, which was essentially sort of an overflow of this uniformity movement, which was sort of imposing certain things into the Eastern rites. And Vatican II comes along in or Orientalium Ecclesiarum and condemns and says that these these churches, the Eastern churches, must have their own rights. And then it speaks of diversity uh, in paragraph number two. The, here, here's the um, comment on liturgical diversity. <clears throat> so this is quoting from Vatican II. Quote, between these, there exists an admirable bond of union, such that the variety within the church in no way harms its unity. Rather, it manifests it. For it is the mind of the Catholic Church that each individual church or rite should retain its traditions whole and entire, and likewise it should adapt its way of life to the different needs of time and place. And this is also, Sacrosanctum Concilium says a very, very similar thing in paragraph four, right in the beginning of the document, saying that it wants to foster every single authentic rite. Right. Um, so can you comment at all about liturgical diversity from this quote, Gregory? Well, I mean, we have, you know, the statement of the of an ecumenical council that liturgical diversity does not harm the unity of of the church. Um, and and in point of fact, I mean, this 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 the history of Latinizations of the Eastern Church really is a, a very sad one in, in in many ways because you know there, there's a very famous example in the United States where a, a substantial chunk of I hope I'm remembering this correctly. I believe they were they were Ruthenians, but if I'm 
if, if anybody wants to correct me in the comments or whatever, that's, that's okay. That who were essentially driven out of communion with the Roman Catholic Church because of the very, very harsh treatment which they received from the Latin bishop, who simply wasn't Latin, there's a Roman right bishop, who simply wasn't interested in, in that exactly that kind of diversity. And then there are all kinds of you know authentic customs which go back to the ages of the fathers in some cases of the Eastern churches that were essentially eclipsed because the you know Catholics of Eastern Rite and, and very often you know the clergy themselves imposed these things um, in imitation of, of, of the Latin Rite and Vatican II rightly saw as expressed in that document that diversity of liturgical forms does not compromise the unity of the church and ordered this to stop. And, and it has to a very large degree stopped. Um, and you really do see among Eastern Catholics uh, a, a, a continual growth of appreciation of their own historical customs. So, I, and I don't see any reason why this cannot be applied to a diversity of forms of the Roman rite as Pope Benedict established them. If a ecumenical council says that, you know, that, that this is not a compromise and, and, and the, the same ecumenical council on which we purport to base the, the reform, um, I just don't see how we can say that, you know, what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. Um, but there is a sort of deeper problem here also, which is that, you know, the Novus Ordo itself has built, has a, a, a dramatic degree of disunity built into it in the sense that as, as, as anyone, if you belong to a large enough diocese, you can find, I, I don't say disunity intrinsic, in the sense of, you know, breaking of communion, but that, you know, if you have the one church that makes use of the, you know, still licit option to celebrate funerals in black, unfortunately it's not done, and sing the Requiem Mass with all of the, you know, chants according to, the, and, 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 and do it in Latin and use incense. And then you have a church down the street, which does it all in white vestments and everything in the vernacular and sings Eagle's Wings. You know, these are the same right in theory. Right. They are the same church. They, 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 the priests have their faculties from the same bishop. So that, you know, there is so much liturgical diversity built into the Novus Ordo itself. It seems very hard to say that, oh, you know, diversity for, the, for me, but not for thee. So, yes. Sometimes it's said that, you know, these are the trads, but these are not all so called trads. These are just kind of P Catholics across the spectrum of tradism, whatever, who are all agreeing on various points that Traditionis Custodius is off base in many different ways. And one of those essays is Cardinal Muller, obviously the former head of the CDF, no small name. He says, quote, for the unity in the confession of the revealed faith and the celebration of the mysteries of grace in the seven sacraments by no means require sterile uniformity in the external liturgical form, as if the church were like one of the international hotel chains with their homogenous design, end quote. Um, when we look at the history of the church, really the 12 apostles and all of the churches they founded and the various languages that the liturgy was celebrated in and the various liturgical traditions and schools of thought that arose manifests a great deal of diversity. Really, there's the Pentecost, the birth of the church is all these different languages are spoken. And it's the same thing with the liturgy as it develops in all sorts of different regions. So there's always been a diversity of yes. liturgy, but with one common faith. Yes. And that's what I think Muller is getting at. And that's really the whole history of the church. So to say that now we need to have this uniformity is really, uh, it's just making up a new idea. Thank you.